goodbye, Philadelphia, and goodbye, family. Hello, coffee on a Tuesday in HD, Vlog 12. So last week, 48 civilian protesters were killed in Tahrir Square, Cairo, in Egypt. 2,000 were wounded. Nine months ago, the square looked like this. Finally, we get our freedom! So, what happened? Maybe you know the story of ancient Egypt. Maybe Mr. Gorecki spent three whole weeks on it in fifth grade and you learned about pharaohs and hieroglyphics and pyramids, which you later made for a project out of foam board or cardboard or sugar cubes or cheese. At the very least, you know about... Now, where there was a young man, he never fought in sea. People stand in line to see the boy king. And maybe you thought all that was fascinating. But the story of modern Egypt is just as incredible. And it's so much at the heart of the cultural shift happening in the Middle East right now that we ought to get an idea of how it goes. Well, it goes like this. The Mamluks, an Egyptian military caste, held power in Egypt from 1250 to 1517 when the Turks of the Ottoman Empire bitched them out and took control. They kept it until 1798 when Napoleon bitched them out, and finally in 1801 Napoleon himself was bitched by the Brits. Now the Brits were only there because the French were, so when the French were expelled, the Brits left too, creating a vacuum of power which the Turks and the Mamluks jumped to fill. In the end, it was neither Turk nor Mamluk who seized control, but rather an Albanian commander who played the two against each other called Muhammad Ali. No, not that one, or that one, that one. Here is the beginning of modern Egypt, 1805. Ali began reforming the country into a modern state, building its military, its industry, and its educated bureaucracy basically from scratch. He did more than any man ever had for Egypt, single-handedly sparking the Arab Renaissance, or the al Nada. He won some battles and gained some territory, and lost some battles and lost some territory. He got older, he got paranoid, he went crazy, and he died. His son assumed power, then he died shortly after. Then his nephew assumed power, and he was killed. Then his fourth son, then his grandson, then his great-grandson, lesser men. By the 1880s, Egypt had become completely dependent on England and France for a healthy economy. And when they tried to break away, England sent in its forces and occupied the country. It stayed under occupation until after the First World War. When the Waft Party, led by Saad Zakul, asked for independence from Britain, something they thought they had been promised, for their sacrifice in the war. The Brits were like, yeah. no. They exiled Zagul to Malta, and this sparked a grassroots uprising, the revolution of 1919. The result of this was the official independence of Egypt in 1992 and the drafting of a first constitution a year later. But their independence was largely in name. Egypt was now a monarchy, with a king backed by the British and subservient to the British Consul General. He died before World War II and was replaced with 16-year-old King Farouk I. This guy, was a British puppet. The Brits used Egypt as a base of Allied operations all throughout World War II. Propaganda from Germany, the Soviet Union, and the United States all added to anti-British sentiment. In 1948, Egypt blundered through the Arab-Israeli war, losing 78% of Palestine in the process. The country blamed, you guessed it, Farouk. And a movement called the Free Officers, led by Mohammed Naguib and Gamal Nasser, orchestrated a military coup in 1952, Egypt's second 20th century revolution. They overthrew Farouk, tossed away the 1923 constitution, and declared Egypt a republic, setting up a one-party system made of all free officers called the Liberation Rally. Naguib was declared the first president of Egypt. They drafted a new constitution, secular in nature, which a group called the Muslim Brotherhood opposed. Two years later, the Muslim Brotherhood was outlawed as an illegal political organization. Two years after that, Naguib was replaced with Nasser as the second president of Egypt, and his first action was to announce the nationalization of the Suez Canal. This man-made canal was a trade superhighway for the Middle East. England and France were pissed because they used the canal so much that they hatched a plan with Israel aimed to overthrow Nasser. At the Portsmouth Naval Base, Britain prepares for the worst in the Suez Crisis. It was a secret plan and a stupid plan, and they should have told the U.S. because when Ike found out, he was pissed. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions. The U.S. was like, get the fuck out of there, dude! And Nasser's prestige was cemented by a proxy victory of the Suez Canal crisis. He ruled for another 18 years, promoted pan-Arabism all throughout his term, led the Six-Day War against Israel, which he lost embarrassingly, and then he died quietly. His vice president, Anwar el-Sadat, succeeded him as the third president 
of Egypt. Sadat's most notable accomplishment was his participation in the Camp David Accords with President Carter and Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, which led to the eventual peace treaty with Israel, a treaty which is still honored today. But Sadat and Egypt were ostracized for this from the Arab League. Opposition came at him from all sides, and during a military parade on the 6th of October 1981, four assassins broke through the barricades and killed him. His Vice President, Hosni Mubarak, assumed power as the fourth and last president of Egypt. Mubarak maintained the peace agreement with Israel while salvaging Egypt's relationship with the Arab League being readmitted in 1989. He privatized much of the economy and Egypt saw extreme growth in the 1990s, partly due to the $14 billion it got in debt relief for its participation in the Gulf War. But Mubarak was an autocrat like Sadat before him and Nasser before him. He reigned unchallenged for 26 years, and in the first election that saw a second candidate in 2005, that candidate, Ayman Nour, was imprisoned. And we can't forget that Egypt has been under emergency law since 1967, which suspends constitutional rights, legalizes censorship, and extends police powers. Under Mubarak, there were repeated occurrences of police brutality and severe corruption among government officials who were hoarding massive amounts of wealth for themselves. By 2011, after a severe worldwide economic crisis, the emotion came to a head and we watched day by day as protesters stormed Tahrir Square and demanded Mubarak step down after 29 years. Inspired by a popular uprising in Tunisia, thousands of Egyptians took to the streets demanding the ouster of President Hosni Mubarak. Oh! Woo! 800 years of history. I need a drink. You can see how Egypt has gestated, how it moved from a tribal state to a sultanate, to a kingdom, to a republic. You can see in Egypt the wave of Middle Eastern history as it tries to crash on the shore of freedom and democracy. But you can also see that their history is one of blood and ferment, led exclusively by military leaders, and always in flux. Well, it's the military who has control again. As the interim leaders, a Supreme Council of 20 generals postpones a civilian-ruled government to the dismay of men. Protests begin again, dozens have been killed, the council apologizes, but it falls on deaf ears. Monday saw the start of a long process of parliamentary elections which won't deliver a new president until mid to late 2012. In the meantime, the council stays in charge. Who will step forward? The Muslim Brotherhood made legal again after 57 years and sure to be a big winner in the first round of parliamentary elections. Will it be leftists, revolutionaries, or just successors of Mubarak? Nobody really knows how it's all gonna turn out, but maybe this is the most important statistic. It's how much 40% of Egypt makes per day. Egyptians want change, but they need stability. And with change, there is no stability. And with stability, there is little change. How do they find democracy? And who will be the stewards of revolution in Egypt? And a movement, and a movement called the Free Officers, led by Mohammed, and a movement, and a movement called the Free Officers, led by Mohammed Nagui. Ah,